Sādvaitam sāvadhūtam parījana sahitam krishna chaitanya devam Shri Radha krishna padan sāgana lalita Shri vishākaṁ vitam shā <coughs> Vancha kalpatarū bhyascha kripa sindhu bhya evacha patitanam pavanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo namo namaha. Namo Mahavadanaya Krishna Prema Pradayati. Krishnaya Krishna Chaitanya 
Namne Gaura Chise Namaha <coughs> Nityanandam Namastubhyam Premananda Pradayane Kalo Kalmashanashaya Janava Patai Namaha Panchatatvatmakam Krishnam Bhakta Rupa Swarupakam Bhakta Vataram Bhaktakyam Namami Bhakta Shaktikam <clears throat> hey Krishna Karna Sindho, Dina Bandho Jagatapati, Go Pesha, Go Pika Kanaka, Radha Khan Tanamostuti, Tapta Khan Shinago Rangi, Radhe Sute Devi, Ranamami Hari. <coughs> Brindai Tulsi Debyai Priyai Keshavasyacha Krishna Bhakti Prade Devi Satyavachai Namo Namaha Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Srivas Adi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare <coughs> First of all I'm offering my Dandavat Pranams and my Shuddha Pushpanjali unto the lotus feet of my most beloved Sikh uh, Diksha Guru Dev Nityalila Pravishta Om Vishnu Pad Tarasata Sri Srila AC Bhakti Vedanta Swami Maharaj Srila Prabhupada. <clears throat> then I'm offering my same Dandavat Pranams and my Shraddha Pushpanjali at the lotus feet of my most beloved Siksha Guru Devs Nityalila Pravishta Om Vishnu Pad. Paramahansa Astutara Sata Sri Shiva, Bhakti Rakshak Sridhar Goswami Maharaj, and Nitya Lila Pravishta Om Vishnu Pad, Paramahansa Astutara Sata Sri Shiva, Bhakti Vedanta Narayan Goswami Maharaj. My Dandavat pronounce to all my Sri Rupa Anuga Guru Varga. And my Dandavat pronounce to all the Vaishnavas and the Vaishnavas. <clears throat> so yesterday we covered some parts of the narration of the Ratha Yatra and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's dancing at Ratha Yatra. And also we came up to the point of when Lord Jagannath had a stop along the way at a place called Balagandhi. And there so many thousands and thousands of devotees came with bog to offer to Lord Jagannath. And from all directions, from behind him on the side and the front, long distances, everyone made their individual offerings. Jagannath accepted all. And uh, in the meantime, Sanya Mahaprabhu, after dancing, sometimes described with the force of a hurricane, his dancing, so Chaitanya Mahaprabhu felt fatigued and he went into a garden, but his fatigue was, he was just completely drowning in Krishna praying. Uh, that was his mood, and how this had been stirred up in this festival. Mm -hmm. And how... And how Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was completely immersed in the moods of Srimati Radhika when seeing Krishna at Kurukshetra. And that whole dynamic of the gopis and Srimati Radhika actually seeing Krishna and then 
having a conversation with Krishna. Srimati Radhika, what she was expressing. What Srimati Radhika was expressing to Krishna at that time. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was enacting this with his dance, his movements of his arms, the whole drama. Mahaprabhu was enacting this. And Swarup Damodar Goswami, uh, he was also singing particular verses and poetries to enhance Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's mood. So all this was going on. Uh, and the, all the thousands and millions of people, they were all seeing Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and completely astonished, all of them completely astonished by his ecstatic dancing. And in fact, they were all being drowned in Krishna praying by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So imagine being there. In that crowd, when Goranga Mahaprabhu is performing such an ecstatic dance. So all of this was taking place. And when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu went into this garden, he found a, a platform, because they had so many trees, big trees in this garden, shade trees, and a wonderful breeze was blowing. So Mahaprabhu entered the garden and then he laid down on this uh, elevated platform underneath the tree. And all the other devotees, uh, they also found different trees and they were lying here and there. So this was the opportunity that the king of Puri, Maharaj Prataparudra, this was the opportunity that he had been waiting for, where he would actually come and directly meet Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So we read yesterday how he, he uh, took off his royal dress. He took off his royal dress and he donned the clothing of very simple Vaishnava clothing. No ornaments, no crown, no nothing. Uh, just his tilak and Vaishnava dress. He came into that uh, foresty area, but before he approached Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he first of all went to each and every one of the intimate associates of Mahaprabhu, especially Nityananda Prabhu, who was resting in one place, Advaita Charya, and he paid his dandavat pranams and begged each one of them for their permission and their blessings. And now he approached Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And when he approached Mahaprabhu, he did full Dandavat Pranams, and Mahaprabhu was in internal consciousness. And this was known by the devotees, what kind of internal consciousness Mahaprabhu was in. Not in uh, Bahir. Bahir means the outward consciousness, but internal. And the king, Maharaj Prataparudra, he immediately began to very gently massage Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's lotus feet and his legs. He began to sing in a very beautiful voice the verses of the Gopi Geet, of the tenth canto, that were sung by the Gopis during the Raslila, and how these gopis were feeling so much separation, agonizing separation from Krishna. And they all came together, and they all sat together on the bank of the Yamuna, which was very the bank, in light of the full moon, and they were calling to Krishna. Krishna was not appearing to them, and they were, <clears throat> each one of them began to sing various songs to Krishna, and all united together, the gopis sang. 
So this um, same narration, these same verses were sung by Maharaj Prataparuja to Chaitanya. And uh, we read yesterday a couple of those verses. In the Chaitanya Charitamrita is only mentioning two of those verses, the first and the ninth verse. And so, uh, and a general translation is there in Chaitanya Charitamrita. Uh, and I told yesterday that today we would again visit that narration and we will hear Srila Gurudev's explanation, Srila Bhakti Vedanta Narayan Goswami Maharaj's explanation, brief also, but it brings one into a more uh, comprehensive understanding of the verse, because all of these verses spoken by the gopis, they had different levels of meaning, uh, because in Braj, what someone directly says is not necessarily what they mean to say, but it is an indirect way. This is the nature of praying, that praying does not express itself directly, but indirectly. Just like Sri Rupa Goswami, he explained how uh, that just like a, uh, a snake, uh, ahi, ahi means snake, goes zigzag. So Rupa Goswami also used that same example of how a snake moves to describe praying. That praying never moves directly, always there is indirect and zigzag way. Huh? Meaning that just like for example when Srimati Radhika is showing jealous anger and refusing to meet Krishna. Hmm? You can even see it in the painting, the Seva Kunj painting, which was directed by Srila Gurudev himself when Jamarani Devi was painting. And you can see how Krishna is sincerely begging to Srimati Radhika and he surrendered his food there at her lotus feet, but still she's refusing. But where are her eyes? Although she's looking in this direction, but her eyes are looking back towards Krishna. You see? So, we'll have some more discussion about this, the nature of praying, and the, the nature of the gopis praying, and, and the uh, jealous anger called man. You know? And that will be on the day after tomorrow. I believe it's on Friday is the Hera Panchami festival. And that day we will have this kata in the evening uh, of the conversation uh, during that festival of between Swarup Damodar Goswami and Srivast Thakur in the presence of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And there the glories of the gopis praying and all their different moods is told by Swarup Damodar Goswami. So this... Uh, narration that we'll read now is from Srila Gurudev's Rathiyatra book, uh, Jagannath Rathiyatra. <clears throat> so as described, <clears throat> exhausted from having danced for so long, Sriman Mahaprabhu went into the garden on the left and he laid down under a tree. A cool, fragrant breeze gently blew over him. And remembering the pastimes of Braja, Prem swelled even more within him. Now on the advice of Shisarva Bhattacharya, King Prataparuja went to Sriman Nityananda Prabhu, Sri Advaitacharya, Sri Ramananda Rai, and Sri Saruk Damodar, he offered pranam, and he said, I am going to serve the lotus feet of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Please give me your blessings. He then removed his royal dress and ornaments and put on an ordinary dhoti. 
And when he approached Sriman Mahaprabhu, he took his lotus feet in his hands and gently and expertly he began to massage them. And while doing so, he sweetly sang Gopigit from Ras Panchadhyay, the five chapters on Ras Lila within Sriman Bhagavatam. <clears throat> so Gurudev now cites this uh, first verse, which is the, the beginning verse of this chapter 31 of the Gopi Geet. Uh, and this verse goes as follows. Jayati te dikam janmana braja shrayata in Shashvadatrahi Dayata Drishyata Dikshuta Vakas Twai Drita Savas Twam Vichinvate. <coughs> the Gopi said, O oh, dearly beloved, because of your birth, in this land of Braja, the entire area has become more glorious than Vaikuntha and other planets. It is for this reason that Lakshmi, the goddess of beauty and wealth, eternally decorates it, Braja, this land of Braja, she eternally decorates it with her presence. But, O oh Lord of our life, in this blissful land of Braja, it is only your beloveds, we gopis, who in separation from you are deeply anguished. We maintain our lives solely for your sake, continuously searching for you in all directions, we therefore please appear before us now. As King Prataparudra sang, overwhelmed with spiritual emotion, Sriman Mahaprabhu's immersion in Bhav increased, and his heart melted even more. As soon as he heard the verses sweetly uttered by the king, he asked, Oh, who is pouring this nectar in my ears? Go on singing, go on singing. Continue giving me this nectar. Then the king, the king continued singing until he came to the following verse. <clears throat> Tavakatam ritam tapta jivanam kavibir editam kalmashapaham shavana mangalam shimadatatam bhuvigrinantite bhuridajanaha O Sri Krishna, ambrosial narrations about you are the life and soul of those tormented by separation from you. Realized persons or poets like Brahma, Shiva, and four Kumaras, they sing of them. Discussions about you vanquish the distress of the fructified prarabdha and unfructified aprarabdha sins. Simply hearing those narrations bestows auspiciousness, and they bestow the wealth of praying. The nectar of your narrations is expanded by those who glorify your pastimes. And therefore, that person 
who performs kirtan of your lila kata in this world is the most generous benefactor. <clears throat> as soon as Sriman Mahaprabhu heard this verse from the lips of the king, he could not check himself. And overwhelmed with praying, he embraced the king. Who are you who are showing me so much kindness? He asked. King Prataparudra replied, I am an insignificant servant of your servants. Then Sriman Mahaprabhu said, <clears throat> To me more dile bahu amulya ratana, more kichu dite nahi dilu alindana. Oh, you have given me many priceless gems, but I am just a penniless beggar. And because I have no wealth, I am unable to give you anything in return. So I can only give you my embrace. This is my only wealth. And then, <clears throat> Sriman Mahaprabhu clasped the king to his heart, and an incessant stream of tears flowed from their eyes. Now Srila Gurudev begins to explain the deep bhav of Gopi Gita. All the verses of Gopi Gita have exceedingly beautiful and esoteric meanings. Each and every verse is connected with the next. Also, uh, Rasika Vaishnavas explain the meaning of each verse in one or more ways. These verses reveal the heartfelt moods of intense separation from Krishna. And feeling this separation, the gopis in great distress they pray, O oh Krishna, please come to us and give your darshan, otherwise we will die. <clears throat> In the first verse, the gopis say, Janmana Vraja. That means, you have taken birth in Vrindavan, in Gokula. And that is why Mahalakshmi sweeps the earth in Vrindavan and performs other services to make it beautiful. Indeed, Vraja is the topmost place of your sweet pastimes. And the ninth verse uh, begins with Tava Katam Ritam. Oh, there are many meanings for this verse. But here, only two are given in brief. The first is the general meaning, and the second is a deeper meaning. So the first meaning of this verse is as follows. The meaning of the words tava katam ritam. The narration of your pastimes is like nectar. Tava katam ritam, your nectar kata. You personally enter his heart in the form of Harikata. Then he quotes Srimad Bhagavatam, first canto, second chapter. Srinvatam Svakata Krishna Punya Shravana Kirtana. Hridiyantak stolhi abhadrani vidunoti suhrit satam. For whoever attentively hears these pastimes, these leelas, then Sri Krishna personally enters that person's ears and heart. And like a dear intimate friend, he removes lust, anger, desires for material enjoyment, 
and all other anarthas that reside there. Having removed these obstacles to bhakti, he makes that heart clean and pure, and he situates himself there for eternity. The living entities who have been averse to the Lord since time immemorial, they have fallen into the cycle of birth and death, and they undergo extreme misery. But narrations of Sri Krishna's past times are like nectar for the jivas who are scorched by the flames of this frightening misery. <clears throat> by faithfully hearing these leelas, the intense despair of the living entities is vanquished. Parikshit Maharaj was due to die after seven days from the bite of a poisonous snake. And no one in this world was capable of saving him. For those seven days, in preparation for death, he completely gave up eating, drinking, and sleeping, and he remained on the bank of the Ganga, hearing Harikata from Shukadev Goswami. Now this verse is just being cited from the 10th canto, first chapter, verse number four. Nivritta tarshai upagiyamanad bhavo sadach trotramano viramat ka uttama shloka gunanu vadat puman vir ajeta vinapashugnat. Glorification of uttama shloka Sri Hari is performed in the Shrota parampara. In other words, having heard such glorification, Samkirtan from the lips of Sri Guru, a person again narrates it. And those glories of Sri Hari are nicely extolled by liberated personalities who have no thirst for anything that is related to Krishna. For the seekers of liberation, the Mamukshus, this Samkirtan is the infallible medicine for the disease of material existence. For devotees who have taste, ruchi, it is the medicinal tonic, rasayan, for the heart and the ears. What intelligent person would stop hearing such glorification of the Lord? Only a butcher would do this. That is, one who is killing his own self. So this verse, well, the fourth shloka of the 10th canto, actually, when Srila Prabhupada gave his introduction to the Krishna book, he cited this verse, because this is really the main verse that actually spoken by Parikshit Maharaj to Shukadeva Goswami. And Parikshit Maharaj has been hearing the entire Srimad Bhagavatam up to this point, all cantos one through nine. Now the 10th canto is beginning. And now the subject matter is going to be exactly Krishna and his eternal pastimes as he manifested them 5,000 years ago. And so uh, this particular verse is being cited by Srila Gurudev because Srila <coughs> Gurudev is explaining the potency of Krishna Kata. That's why he cited the previous verse, Shrim Vatam Svakata Krishna. So, in this verse, Gurudev is telling that Nivritta Tarshaya Upagiya Manad. So, this means those persons who are completely free huh, from any material desires whatsoever. Nivritta Tarshaya. Upagiyamanad. What they are singing, what they are reciting, the nectar that is coming from them. Bavo, bavo shadach, shrotramano abiramat. So bavo shadi, what does that mean? Bhava oshad. Oshad means medicine, and bhava means material existence. So this nectar of this narration 
Upagiyamana, which is flowing from the lips of Shukadeva Goswami, who is completely near Vritta Tarashire, it is the medicine uh, from which the whole material existence will be completely cured. All the sufferings. Shrotra Mano Abhiramat, and it also means, Abhiram means, it is giving such happiness, such pleasure to hear those narrations. So the question is being asked, Ka means who? Ka Uttama Shloka Gunanu Vadat. Who would not be attracted to hear such beautiful narration of Uttama Shloka? The Supreme Lord Sri Krishna himself, who is praised by the highest poetry ever to emanate from anyone's mouth. He's called Uttama Shloka, topmost verses of poetry to glorify him. So who will not be attracted to this amongst the human society? Only one category of person. Kuman virajeta vina pushugnat. Pushugnat has two meanings. <clears throat> the word pashu means animal, and ganat means killer. So those who are accustomed to killing animals, they are in such low-grade level of consciousness, attracted to this, but everyone else will be very attracted. Huh? But also, pashugnat is referring to a person who is killing his own soul. It's killer of the soul. Atmahana is another term. Atmahana, who kills their own atma. And that is what is going on. In fact, I was just hearing a lecture of Srila Prabhupada's a couple of days ago, where he's directly talking about this principle of killing the old person's own soul. In modern society, everyone is killing their own soul because of ignorance. And that means what? That means that you've gotten, or you've attained the human form of life, but uh, you are completely misusing it, and you are accruing very, very bad sinful reactions which will drag you down into the lower species in next life and future lifetimes. So in one sense, this, can, this is called killing of the soul, because the soul has been kept down in lower consciousness in all the lower species of life for millions and millions and millions of lifetimes, years, who knows how many hmm, creations of the universes that all the jivas have been wandering in all these different species of life. So human form of life is meant for hearing from the authorized pure personalities. Then it will be the medicine uh, that will eradicate this whole material existence. So this verse, fourth verse of the 10th canto, is telling that this glorification of Uttama Shloka Sri Hari, it is performed in this parampara called the Shrota Parampara. In other words, having heard such glorification from the lips of Sri Guru, then a person again narrates it. And those glories of Sri Hari are nicely extolled by liberated personalities who have no thirst for anything that is unrelated to Krishna. Huh? And for the seekers of liberation, those are called mumokshus. This sankirtan is the infallible medicine for the disease of material existence. And for the devotees who have taste, ruchi, it is the shrotra mano abhiramat. Huh? For those devotees who have taste, ruchi, it is the medicinal tonic, rasayan, for the heart and the ears. So what intelligent person would stop hearing such glorification of the Lord? Only a butcher would do this, or that is one who is killing his own self. So Gurudev is now explaining that Srila Shukadev Goswami he had no worldly desires at all. The Harikata spoken by such a rasik, tattva gya devotee, a devotee who is fully conversant with the principles of transcendental rasa, is the infallible medicine 
or the disease of material existence. This is because such harikata removes all kinds of diseases that are subsequent results of the disease of material existence. Lust, anger, and desires for worldly enjoyment, which accompany the snake bite of the worldly threefold miseries, they are also quickly removed. Now Gurudev is explaining the words tava katam ritam tapta jivanam. The harikata that is coming from the lotus mouth of a realized rasik devotee who thoroughly explains the sweet pastimes of Krishna, it pacifies the listener and he receives new life. Tapta jivanam. By regularly hearing such harikata, one becomes full of happiness, not only in this life, but in the next life as well. Such a human being gradually climbs the steps of bhakti and attains the abode of the Lord, where he is forever immersed in an ocean of ananda, transcendental bliss. The next words in the verse, kavibir iditam, means great kavis and poets, such as Sri Brahma, Sri Sukadeva Goswami, Sri Valmiki, Sri Krishna Dvaipayana, Sri Vyasadeva. They sing Sri Krishna Kata, the narrations of Sri Krishna. Kavibir iditam. Kavi means great poets. Next words, kalmasha apaha. By hearing and chanting Sri Krishna Kata, all kinds of sins and of past actions disappear very quickly. Kalmasha means the all the miseries uh, coming from all sinful reactions. They're all quickly vanquished by hearing Krishna Kata. Then comes Shravana Mangalam. The word Shravana Mangalam, it means by ceaselessly hearing Sri Krishna Kata, one attains all kinds of results in life. Mangalam. It's like we have Mangal Artik. Now we have the Mangal Artik song. Mm -hmm. Mangala Shri Guru Gaura Mangala Murati, Mangala Shri Radha Krishna Jubala Pariti, Mangala Nishanta Lila, Mangala Udai, uh, like this. So Mangal is used in every verse. Mangala, Mangala, Mangala. Now what does that mean? Shravanam Mangalam. Uh, this Krishna Katamrita, Tava Katamritam, Tapta Jivanam, Kavibir Iditam, Kalma Shapaham, uh, Shravana Mangalam. By hearing your kata, the gopis are telling to Krishna, by hearing your kata, oh, everyone attains the most auspicious results in their life. By ceaselessly hearing. Then comes Srimad Atatam. Shravana Mangalam, Srimad Atatam. Now the word Shri means fame. So the, the Shri of that person who sings Harikata, it spreads throughout the entire world. Srimad Atatam. Then Buridha. So Buridha means great benefactor. Uh, the greatest benefactors in this world are those who distribute Krishna's glories, and thereby they uplift the whole world. Even if a king gives away his entire kingdom, or a wealthy man gives his entire wealth and opulence, it does not qualify them as Burida. What is the meaning of Burida? Benefactor. So at the end of this verse, it is saying, Burida Jana. Huh? Gopis are telling, anyone who distributes 
this great, greatest benediction to the whole world. They are the most great, they are the greatest benefactors. Buddhida jana. And in comparison, even if a king, uh, he uh, gives away his entire kingdom or a wealthy man gives his entire wealth and opulence, that does not qualify them to have this title attached to their name. Buddhida uh, the greatest benefactor. The greatest benefactors are those who describe Krishna's sweet pastimes and, and they describe them to others. No one else can be called Buddha. That's why Mahaprabhu, when he heard the king, Prataparudra, singing this verse and he came to the end of the verse where it says Buddha Jana. Oh, then Mahaprabhu said, Buddha. He was directly what great wealth was being given to him through this kata. So now, there is a second meaning to this verse, which Srila Gurudev is now going to be describing another level uh, to this verse. And without understanding this, no one can understand the Gopi Gita. Actually, we have to read the entire Gopi Gita book that Gurudev has presented, which has commentaries of Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur and other acharyas, and goes very deeply into each and every verse. What is the outward meaning? Which we just heard. That's the outward meaning. All these words defined, this is the outward understanding. But the internal and the deeper understanding will now be given, Gurudev is explaining. Because remember, the Brajagopis are feeling intense separation mood from Krishna and they're crying. And they're singing and crying out their hearts to Krishna. But they also have certain moods very deep within their hearts. So the first word in this verse, the first two words are Tava Katamrita. And what does that mean? It means in separation from you, your kata is not life-giving nectar. Amrita. Right? Tava kata amrita. So, in separation from you, O Krishna, your kata is not life-giving nectar. It is mritta, deadly poison. This is how the gopis are perceiving. Huh? Katam ritam means kata amritam. So the first meaning was telling that this is the amritam, the nectar. But here the gopis have separated these words differently. That's how you can do in Sanskrit. They are very experts. Yeah. All the bridge basis, they know all these methods of expressing themselves directly, indirectly. So the gopis are saying, they're, they're separating the kata word from mrita. Amrita means kata. But then kata mrita means deadly poison. Your kata is deadly poison. And the reason for this is that when, in separation from you, we hear your narrations of your pastimes, then the fire of separation intensifies even more. And we writhe in agony. Flames. So for us, your kata is mrita. Understand? Tapta jivanam. Tava kata mritam, tapta jivanam. The gopis, like Srimati Radhika, they say, we are the proof of this. Before, we were perfectly happy in our family life, but the moment we fell in love with this Sri Krishna, all these problems began. Now we are completely helpless. He has turned us into street beggars, and we have no place to take shelter, and now we are on the verge of death. And if anyone wants to remain happy in family life, then he should never ever hear Krishna's pastimes which cause distress. So 
the Tukta Jivanam, <coughs> the first meaning was what? It removes all the sufferings from your life. But the gopis, they're experiencing the opposite. Do we really believe what they're saying? Do we believe what the gopis are saying? Is this true? What's happening to them? Or not? Because on one side, there's a completely opposite meaning, and now they're experiencing this opposite meaning. So is this really true? What we're hearing? How the gopis are feeling in their hearts towards Krishna? Huh? That we're the proof of this? That before we were perfectly happy in our family life and then the moment we fell in love with this Sri Krishna, all these problems began. Now we are completely helpless. He has turned us into street beggars. We have no place to take shelter. We're on the verge of death. And if anyone wants to remain happy in their family life, they should never ever hear Sri Krishna's pastimes. It caused so much distress. And what should we think? What should we understand? We who are hearing this explanation of how the gopis' moods are being expressed in their words. Hmm? There's the outward meaning, and then there's the internal meaning. But what should we think? Are they actually really going through such agonizing suffering? I mean, if that was the case, I don't think any of us would ever have taken up this process of Krishna consciousness. Hmm? And what to speak of them, who are on the very, very highest inconceivable level of praying. So what's going on here? Let's try to understand this. Meeting and separation. Meeting and separation. But they're agonizing. They're agonizing. They're not meeting Krishna. That's what's causing their suffering right now. They're not meeting Krishna. Is there a more, more intense ananda in such uh, virahas? I don't know. Is there? It's multidimensional. That's what I thought Gurudev said about the meeting and separation, is that because they're in such deep separation that they think about Krishna even more, and therefore Krishna is with them. Mm -hmm. So in one sense, they are in some sense that they're they are with Krishna, and it's not a place where they're not. And then we hear also the stories about how Shri Mataraka, even though, even though Krishna is right there, she goes into a state of, <clears throat> just by one comment, that Krishna is not there, and then she's all like, oh, she goes into this whole mana, how she's not in sense separation, even though Krishna's there, but... I, I, I get it, though, they're saying it directly, they're saying yes. Yeah, well, there's another you know, example. Rupa Goswami has written, written one verse where he is warning everyone in that verse that if you want to go on enjoying your family life and your love of your relatives and your family and, and all of these material mundane affairs, then I'm telling you, don't go to the banks of the Yamuna at Keshi Ghat, in the moonlight, moonlit night, because what will happen to you? It will be very dangerous. If you go there, you will see this one beautiful boy who is holding his flute to his lips, and the moonbeams, they are reflecting off of his beautiful crimson and he's smiling and his eyes are moving here and there, very restlessly. Oh, don't go! Because if you see this person, what will happen to you? You will be completely unable ever to return to your family affairs and all your mundane material happiness in this world. Don't go! Don't go! Bhaktivinoda Thakur has also written a song based upon that Sanskrit verse. He's saying, it is very, very dangerous. Don't go. But why did Rupa Goswami write such a warning? 
Because it actually in the verse is telling you don't go. Well, what's his intention of that verse? What's his intention for writing that? Well, the forbidden is always fascinating. <laughs> actually, he's telling in an indirect way. Because your so-called happiness of your mundane existence is full of misery and suffering. But you're attached to it under illusion. Huh? But if you go there, that's going to break that attachment. You will never, ever again be able to go back to that mundane materialistic life of material enjoyment with your friends and family and society and all of this. You'll not be able to enjoy that anymore. So Rupa Goswami, he's actually telling, yes, go there. Because then uh, you will be attracted to Krishna and all of your material illusion and problems and everything will be dispelled forever. And you'll become attracted and attached to him and then you'll attain praying for him. That the, uh, the snake. Uh, yeah, so it's an indirect. Mm -hmm. So the gopis are feeling like this. It's not that they're pretending. One thing to understand about Krishna Prem, which is described uh, by Krishnadas Kavaraj Goswami, is that the very nature of Prem, in the mood of Vipralamba separation, the separation mood is so intense and it is like burning, actually. It is like burning, blazing fire, being burnt. But that is the feeling externally. Bahire visha jvala means <clears throat> like the burning of poison. Their existence is being burned. Their feeling. <clears throat> But antare, internally, anandamai. Anandamai. If this was not anandamai, why would Sri Krishna want the moods of Srimati Radhika, who exhibits the most extreme suffering in separation, and he himself experienced that? Why? Because it is the highest ananda. But outwardly they feel like this. And they're telling that to Krishna. They're expressing this to Krishna. Huh? If anyone wants to remain happy in family life, then he should never hear, never ever hear Krishna's pastimes. They cause so much distress. Then the gopis talk about Iditam. Kavi. The poets, they have the capacity to praise even a horse made of paper <laughs> with words. Shishiguru Gauranga Gandhar Vika Giridhari Shishi Radha Govinda Jiu Ki Jai Jagannath Abhilajya Siddhartha Jai So poets, uh, they have this capacity, this ability to praise things. They can praise a horse that is made of paper with words such as, this horse is strong and robust and is able to run more swiftly than the wind. But their words are of no value. They also make statements like, by hearing narrations of Sri Hari, all kinds of good fortune will arise. This is simply not true, the gopis are saying. This is how the gopis are describing kavi bir iditam, that the great kavis and poets, so they're belittling these poets, right? Yes, they have such ability, but it has no value. Uh, and 
They also make statements like, oh, by hearing narrations of Sri Hari, all kinds of good fortune will arise. This is simply not true, gopis are telling. Sri Krishna has cheated us. And his narrations have also cheated us. We could not care less for these narrations. And we want to warn every person who has an attraction for Krishna Kata to not hear it. Any lady who hears these narrations huh, will forget her husband and her children. Any lady who hears these narrations will forget her husband and children and will end up like a bird without a nest. And she will always lament and cause her friends to, to weep as well. Oh, those who want to happily remain with their relatives, they should not hear descriptions of that black Christian. If by chance they do hear them, they will certainly cut off all familial relationships and become mad. Always calling out, Krishna, Krishna, Krishna. They will aimlessly wander here and there, just like us. Singing in praise of Krishna is poison. There is no doubt. Anyone who does not want to become mad like this, they should not hear narrations of Sri Krishna. Moreover, they should never hear from the mouth of cheaters who come with a scripture under their arm to allure people, saying, Come to me. I have come to tell you sweet narrations of Sri Hari. You do not need to be concerned about paying any fee. I will speak this kata free of charge. Simply hear it. While these duplicitous coveys speak Hari Kata in a voice as beautiful as a parrot's. The listener becomes charmed and fully immersed in that kata. And then he gives up his household family, his household family and everything, and he becomes a The speaker of such kata can be compared with a cruel hunter who attracts a deer with the sweet sound of his flute only to slaughter it once it comes near. These trickster narrators, they are indeed buddhi da jana, means the destroyers or the killers of those who hear them. They've separated the word buddhi da jana and into buddhi da jana. Yes, these Trickster narrators are indeed buddhi da jana, the destroyers or the killers of those who hear them. Remain wary of them. But what can we do? Sri Radhaji and her sakis, they continue, what can we do? We can never give up listening to Sri Krishna's Lila Kata, and we can never give up thinking about it. So in this way, even though Sri Radha and her sakis want to forget Sri Krishna because they are overwhelmed with Krishna praying, they are unable to do so for a single moment. A feeling can be expressed in two ways, directly or indirectly. However, the purpose of those who express such a feeling is the same. Here we have given both kinds of explanations of the aforementioned shloka, the direct and the indirect. The deep intention of both, the deep intention of both of these is to state that we should always listen to discussions of Sri Krishna's pastimes. The result will be that all material attachments are very easily cut. So, this is Gurudev's discussion of the chapter And uh, chapter 8 is describing Sriman Mahaprabhu's mood at Ratha Yatra. 
And this is amazing. Mahaprabhu, Gurudev's description of Mahaprabhu's mood at Ratha Yatra. We'll begin a little bit of it before the Arti. <clears throat> at the time of Ratha Yatra, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, overwhelmed with bhav, he began to offer a prayer to Lord Sri Jagannath Dev before his chariot. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu saw Lord Jagannath Dev as his Pranavallava, the beloved of his life. Rajendra Nandan Shyam Sundar. He never saw him as Vasudev Krishna of Dwarka. You understand this point? He saw Krishna as who? Yes. And he never saw him as who? As Dwarka. Yes. Krishna of Dwarka. Vasudev Krishna. Although, when Jagannath is there in the temple, of, it is considered to be Dwarka. But he is the king of Dwarka. And that's why Baladev and Subhadra are there with him, with Sudarshan Chakra. But at the same time, when Mahaprabhu would come to have Darshan of Jagannath, even though that's the considered to be Dwarka, but Mahaprabhu is Srimati Radhika. Completely overwhelmed in the moods of Srimati Radhika. And Srimati Radhika, this is going to be explained actually, how Srimati Radhika has three different manifestations. You've heard this before? Three different manifestations of Radha. What is the first one? Vrisha Bhanu Nandini. When Srimati Radhika is in Braj with Krishna, performing all the leelas and pastimes. So, she is always in her original form, which is Vrishabhanu Nandini, the daughter of King Vrishabhanu. Just like Krishna is the son of the king of Braj, he is the son of Mother Yashoda. That's Krishna's original eternal form. And that form never leaves Vrindavan, does it? Does that form of Krishna, who is the son of Mother Yashoda, does he get on a chariot and leave Vrindavan and go to Mathura? No? He goes to a certain point and then he meets uh, Akura and then... What is that certain point? Uh, like for the, no, the edge of Vrindavan. Yeah. The borderline. The, the borderline. The spot, right? Does he go any further not from that point? Not one inch. Not one <laughs> As it is told, not even one step. Yeah. He... Uh, uh, Vrindavana Prityaja Padam Ekam Nagachati. Padam Ekam means one step. Krishna has never and will never go one single step out of Vrindavan. When Krishna manifests in our universe, he's still there in the eternal spiritual world. Uh, he can have unlimited forms and unlimited universes. Krishna can expand unlimitedly. <clears throat> but that he's the same original. The same original. It's not actually technically an expansion of Krishna. It's actually himself. And that Krishna, he never, never has and never will leave Vrindavan. Why? Why will that Krishna never leave Vrindavan? Because there's so much love and affection. <laughs> yes. So much rasa. Also because it's his soul. Hmm? Also because Braj is his soul. Well, yes. But the main thing is what is Krishna tasting and receiving from all of his devotees as he's performing his infinite pastimes. We've heard some of his pastimes in the 10th canto. But Krishna is performing infinite pastimes eternally there in the Nityadam. And when he comes into the material universes, 
He again shows everyone. This is his mercy. He shows the whole creation. Here I am. This is my branch. Come to me and be eternally with me. Krishna is inviting all the conditioned souls through his pastimes, through uh, the narration of his pastimes, which we've been discussing, Tavakatamritam, the nectaring narration of Krishna's pastimes. So Krishna never, he never leaves Vrindavan, but it looks like he's leave, left Vrindavan because he gets back on the chariot of Akrura and Balaram also, and then they go to Mathura. So, is Krishna actually going, the Krishna who is the son of Nanda Maharaj? No. He doesn't go one step out. His expansion grows. Who is the son of Vasudev? Vasudev Krishna form. And that Vasudev Krishna form performs all the remainder of the pastimes in the 10th canto. Uh, when Krishna stays in Mathura, and then he, he creates Dwarka and transfers all of his uh, family members there, the other dynasty, to Dwarka. And up until the end of Krishna's manifest pastimes, he's there. <coughs> so, uh, the point making here is that Krishna also has different forms for his pastimes, and Radhika also. Because when Krishna got on the chariot in Nandagaon of Akrura, along with Balaram and all the gopis, stood in front of the chariot in the, horse, in the horses and even threw themselves in the pathway, uh, there was no way that they could ever, ever tolerate that Krishna is going to go away from them. And but somehow or other, Akrura managed to drive the chariot and dodge the gopis and somehow or other. But along the way, Krishna also stopped and assured the gopis, I will return. In two or four days, I have some things to accomplish. So that Krishna, he got on the chariot, but he never went out of brunch. And the Vasudeva feature of Krishna now continues. So Shrimati Radhika, Shrimati Radhika never leaves Braj, just like Krishna never leaves Braj. That original form of Radhika, Prishabhana Nandini, the daughter of Prishabhana, she never leaves. But then, when Krishna has apparently left Vrindavan, what happens to the gopis? Hmm? The scene of devastation. Utter devastation. Every single, not just the gopis, all the Vrindavasis, even the birds, even the trees, they're all weeping and weeping in separation. So the form of Srimati Radhika at that time, she is called Vyogini Radha. Vyogini. She is in Vyog, not meeting, not meeting. And so for all that time period, <coughs> Srimati Radhika is experiencing the most intense separation and the gopis. But finally when they journey, the Vrijabhasis left and went to Kurukshetra where there was going to be a solar eclipse and the Yadu dynasty came and that's where they met Krishna at Kurukshetra, right? That form of Radhika, who is meeting Krishna at Kurukshetra, because which Krishna is she meeting there at Kurukshetra? Huh? Vasudev Krishna, not Nandanandan Krishna. So her form is also Another form called Samyogini Radha. Samyog means meeting. So Samyogini Radha is there, and Krishna is there, and also those forms, they are Radha and Krishna, 
And they are feeling and remembering their relationship in their youth, in Vrindavan. All of those things are there, right? So when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has taken all the moods and the complexion of Srimati Radhika and is experiencing, in Jagannath Puri especially, all these moods of separation. Huh? So that form uh, of Srimati Radhika, when she's feeling the happiness of being united with Krishna in Vrindavan, that form Mahaprabhu also experiences internally. He experiences that internally. Then when Mahaprabhu goes to meet with uh, Gadadhar Pandit at Totagopinath Temple and hears Bhagavatam being read by Radharani herself in the form of Gadadhar Pandit. And all those moods are being expressed and explained to Mahaprabhu. Then Mahaprabhu goes to the Gambira, his room, where every single day and night, day and night, day and night, he's merged in these moods of separation. And in that situation, he's like the yogini, Radha, who's like when Srimati Radhika is there in the forests surrounding Nandagam. Krishna has left on the chariot. And now they just lie there. And Srimati Radhika and the gopis are weeping and they're devastated. They've in this intense separation. And then, at that time, that is Vyogini Radha. And when Mahaprabhu is in the Gambira, that's why Lalita and Vishaka are there. In the form of Ramananda Roy and Surupamana Goswami. Because they are assisting Radha, Krishna, in the form of Radha, in the form of Vyogini Radha. And she is immersed in tasting all these moods by the poetry of Jayadev Goswami, Chandi Das, and various other authors, Bilva Mangal Thakur, Krishna Karnamrita, and day and night, day and night. They're singing the appropriate verses for Mahaprabhu to taste all these moods. <clears throat> but then when Mahaprabhu goes to the temple every day and has darshan, then it is similar to Kurukshetra, where Radhika is seeing Krishna. You see, although it's Dwarka, but it's similar to Kurukshetra. And particularly when Jagannath comes on the Rath cart and performs the Rathiyatra festival and Mahaprabhu is dancing and singing in front of Jagannath, what is this showing? This is showing Srimati Radharani and the gopis pulling Krishna on the chariot of their hearts back to Vrindavan, bringing Krishna back to Vrindavan. So we can imagine how Mahaprabhu is tasting these moods of Srimati Radhika's praying and becomes, becoming so overjoyed and so overwhelmed. That's why when he's sitting or lying in the garden and Maharaj Prataparudra comes and then speaks these verses, he's saying, you have just given me the most valuable gems. What can I give you? I have nothing, only my embrace. You know? So like this, it will be explained by Gurudev in future classes, how Chaitanya Mahaprabhu always saw Lord Jagannath as his prana balabha, the beloved of his life. Krishna as her prana balabha. So who is that? Rajendra Nandan Shyamasundra. And he never saw Krishna as Vasudev Krishna of Dwarka. And Sriman Mahaprabhu, he is indeed Sri Krishna himself endowed with the mood, the bhav, and the luster, the kanti of Sri Radha, in this lila, being deeply immersed in the bhav of Srimati Radhika, he spoke a verse from Srimad Bhagavatam as he remembered the pastimes of Braja. And that verse we'll discuss tomorrow in the class, and we'll go further in hearing about what are Srimad Mahaprabhu's moods at the Rathi Yatra. I have one more question in regards to that. When we talk about, at least the way that my train of thought was going while you were speaking about um, 
Nandana Krishna, then Vasudeva Krishna, and then you said also Sri Matriyadi has three three different uh, manifestations for Shravana Nandini, and where she's mm -hmm. that's present in Vrindavan only. Mm -hmm. And then we have uh, uh, what's the Yogini. The Yogini, which is separation, and then we have some Yogini, which is Kurukshetra, which even though she sees him as mm -hmm. uh, Nandana Krishna, she's st she's still meeting with Vasudeva Krishna, correct? I mean, and, and then... Yes but, and no. What, you want to say something? Well, it's, it, I'm just asking the question, is it the same kind of... When he goes into the temple, the same as Samyogini Radha at Kurukshetra, that he says, I, I know who you really are. You're playing the part of the king, but he's actually seeing, as you said before, Gopal Krishna, Govinda. Mm -hmm. He's seeing on the altar, he's saying, <coughs> you're dressed as a king. But I know who you really are, the core of you. Oh, well, yes. I mean, the whole Kurukshetra pastime is Radha and Krishna actually meeting. But externally, there's a barrier for their actually meeting. Right? Because of the atmosphere there. Yes. So, yeah, all of that. You know, and the infantry and the horses and the, you know, it's like Krishna's a king with a whole dynasty there with him. Even his mother and father, a parent, mother and father, Vasudeva and Devaki are there. And even Nanda and Yashoda, they come, uh, and all the bridge bhasis come. But this meeting cannot be an actual meeting for them. Yeah, but it's internal meeting. This is the thing. Very deep internal meeting. I want to give one example that Gurudev gave, which I've heard him tell it a couple of times, a few times. That he gave an example that when he was young in the Gaudiya Mat, and he was sent along with one senior Vaishnava to go to the marketplace, vegetables to bring back to the temple. And you know, very very big baskets and they pile everything in there and then they lift up the basket and put it on their head for carrying it, right? That's the normal way that people carry such things in India. And Gurudev was explaining that this other Vaishnava was more elderly, so he offered, oh, I will, I will carry it. You, you should not carry it. And Gurudev was describing that you know, it was a, quite a bit of a distance that he was carrying this, and it started to become heavier, then heavier, then heavier as he was carrying it, right? And he was saying that, you know, he had to like focus all of his determination to continue carrying it, and you know, they were getting closer, closer, closer to the final destination, right? And it became heavier and heavier right up to that last final moment where they came onto the doorstep and he took the, the, the heavy load off of his head and put it down and <sighs> he felt such relief at that point. So he is he using this example with this heavy weight as being the situation of Shimati Radha. The closer that she came, it was such unbearable, intolerable separation. The closer she came, the closer, the closer, the closer. And up to the last moment when she actually arrived there and the gopis came and all the bridge bhasis and they saw Krishna, that was like so difficult because now Krishna's in this other costume He's in another mood. He's surrounded by all, but they're meeting together. And this is the shloka which Rupa Goswami wrote. The shloka describing how I am that same Radha that he was, you know, Mahaprabhu was singing this other verse, mundane poetry. But then Rupa Goswami wrote a corresponding verse and revealed what was Mahaprabhu's that you are the same Krishna. I am the same Radha. Certainly we are meeting, and this meeting is full of happiness, but 
I want to bring you back in our youth. And she's describing how Krishna was so beautiful playing his flute and the so delicately, you know, his flute song completely stole her heart and completely attracted her heart. Radha, Radharani is expressing that to Krishna there at Kurukshetra. And she becomes so immersed in that Krishna, my heart is Vrindavan. So I want that you will come and you will return again to Vrindavan. If you will do that, then I will consider you the most compassionate person. So this is the mood of Vyogini Radha, uh, sorry, Samyogini Radha at Kurukshetra. And there was this internal mood that we're bringing Krishna back to Vrindavan. And that is the Rathayatra mood. We'll hear more of it from Gurudev expanding this understanding. But without this understanding, we'll to understand the Rathayatra uh, festival of Lord Jagannath and Mahaprabhu and all the Vaishnavas, uh, all the associates of Mahaprabhu's taking part in that. Because it's not an external thing. It's completely internal. But externally, this is what is manifesting. All of these ecstatic symptoms, as we heard yesterday, and Mahaprabhu, like a syringe, tears from his eyes, and all the other ecstatic symptoms crashing to the ground. This is all exhibited by Mahaprabhu into, because of the internal moods. So that answers your question? First part. What was the second part? The second part might be a little bit. I, the second part was just, <coughs> I'm, I'm picturing Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, and I'm saying, we're seeing non different than Sri Radha and Krishna. So is that not Sri Radha and Krishna in their manifestations as Vishabhana Namdini and Namdini Krishna? And then therefore, this may be an external thing, which is kind of what you did explain, but they're outside of Vrindavan, or internally they're always in Vrindavan and they're experiencing these moods together in internally. Because externally Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is outside of there, and externally also he's he's interacting with uh, with uh, not the Christian Jagannath. No, but Shrimati Radhika only sees Sri Nandanandan Krishna, even at Kurukshetra. Yeah. That's all that she sees, but she sees that this external. So then the you're, physical you're really presence, that Nanda Nanda, the, the, physi the physical lo locale then has no significance necessarily then. And where no. Shri Mahaprabhu is. Not for these two forms of Krishna and Srimati Radhika. They have these separate forms. They're still in Vrindavan. So when Radhika is going, it's the, that same Vrishabhana Nandini is still there in Vrindavan, and yeah. Krishna is also still there. And as Gurudev says, in another Prakosht, in another Prakosht, another reality, they are performing their pastimes in Vrindavan. Yeah. But when, when Srimati Radhika is Vyogini, and she's lying there in the forest for all those years, Krishna's coming every day, as we heard. He's coming every day. We heard that yesterday. Krishna's telling that to Radhika at Kurukshetra. Actually, I come every day because I worship Lord Narayan. And Lord Narayan enables me to come there and actually I'm meeting with you every day. So, like this. So anyway, it's not so... We'll hear more about it, but we should contemplate this because Gurudev considered this very essential to understand these tattvas of Radha tattva and Krishna tattva and the three manifestations like that. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, being Srimati Radhika, is actually tasting all those moods in all these three manifestations. Maharaj, I just have a really quick question. Um, isn't it like the equivalent of a time when Krishna went to Dwarka before Radha met, they met in groups, etc.? No. Years, no. Years? Actually, when I was in Vrindavan recently, Bhatta, who is a very great scholar of Vaishnava in Vrindavan, he's been giving classes for the last couple of years, two, three years. And based upon his classes, this one uh, uh, Vaishnavi, whose name, her name is Nagari, she's one of the Russian translators, she'd been living in Vrindavan at least for like 10, more than 10 years. 
Uh, and she, no, more like 15 years actually. And she put together, based upon what she was uh, hearing from Achuta Lalbata, a very fascinating calendar she put together. And there were many things revealed there on that calendar about the timelines, the timeline, you see, of Krishna and how long he stayed in Mathura. And then he went to Dwarka and how long there. Because it's not so clear when you're just reading the, the verses and so forth. But this meeting at Kurukshetra, I can't remember exactly, because I, I didn't write this down at that time, but I can find this out. So maybe 20 years, something like that, Mathura. And why? Because Jarasandha attacked Mathura how many times? I think it was 18 times. Huh? Yeah, he was defeated every time. So it's not like he can just go back and come back the next day. He has to amass another army. All of them have been killed by Krishna, right? So it was something like around that amount of time, 20 years. And there's another thing, is that when Krishna returned, there's a pastime that actually Krishna returned. According to the verses of the Bhagavatam, we don't see that Krishna returned, but the Acharyas have explained that Krishna was also telling to Srimati Radhika at Kurukshetra that I still have a few demons left to kill, but very soon I will be returning. And what did Krishna do? He killed Dantavakra. Dantavakra was the other demon. You know, it was like Shishupal and Dantavakra. They were the three forms of Jai Vijay in the three incarnations, right? Jai Vijay. And so Dantavakra, Shishupal was already killed, and now Dantavakra. So when Krishna killed Dantavakra, then he crossed the Yamuna River, and then he united with the all the bridge Vasis. He united with them. That is the very Nandanandan Krishna. And now, after uniting with them, he transported them all back to Goloka Vrindavan. And that's the end of the Nandanandan Krishna. Everything after that, including battle of Kurukshetra and everything, it's all Vasudev Krishna from that point on. Yeah. Because Krishna actually took them all back to the Nityadam. Gaur Primane, Hari Bol, Shri Satchinandana Gaur Hari Ki Jai, Shri Jagannath Deva Ki Jai, Shri Jagannath Rath Yatra Ki Jai, Shri Chaitanya Charitam Ritam Ki Jai, Shri Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami Pada Ki Jai, Shri La Prabhupada Ki Jai, Shri La Guru Deva Ki Jai, Shri Rupa Nuga Guru Varga Ki Jai, Samaveta Bhakta Vrinda Ki Jai, Nitai Go Primanande Hari Hari. Vanchara, Kripa Sindhu, Vedacha, Vaishnava, Jai, 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 Jai